250 together in your hymnal, 250, there's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Let's all stand together as we sing. He keeps me singing on that first. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's heaven. singing this morning. Good to see you in church. Can you hear this? I don't hear it at all. Brother Dean? Hello? Are you hear me back there? I think we need something else. He got a, we got a new mixer in the sound room and so we got to tweak all the different microphones and uh, some of you rather like it down lower but uh, it's not, you're not going to get your wish, okay? And uh, good to see you here today and uh, much sickness around. It has made our choir an ensemble but uh, I appreciate them being there and singing. And uh, we're going to have a good service together this morning. Appreciate you being in church today. Let's bow for prayer together, shall we? Father, we thank you for another opportunity for us to be together here this morning. We do pray for those unable to be with us today because they're sick. And seems to be a lot of that sickness around right now, Lord. And we're asking for your healing hand to be upon them. Raise them up, please, that they could be back with us soon. But, Lord, we're here today. And we're here. And you promised that when we gather together that you'd be here, too. And so we ask you to speak to our hearts and minister to each of us today. May your will be done in our midst this morning. Control the service and make it exactly what you would like it to be. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And the wind is blowing strong when the wind is around me and my strength is almost gone when, when the, the valley, valley plunges deeper and life shatters all my dreams then i lift my voice to jesus and, and he gives my spirit wings god gives wings god gives run the race before us he has won the victor's crown and he called to every christian follow me to higher ground god gives wings as eagles god gives wings to fly and strength to rise I'm 
Amen. Number 40 in your hymnal. Number 40. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Number 40. Let's sing that first, second, and last together. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Each moment in the crucified, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with. All right, listen carefully now. We have a few announcements for you. Uh, the regular schedule today, 5.30, is our Christian growth class, and we meet down in the conference room right across from our nursery, and uh, that's open to everyone who'd like to come, and uh, especially if you're a new Christian, you ought to be there and get a good, solid foundation on which you can build your life on. Uh, tonight's lesson is going to be on our enemy. Uh, you think, uh, don't think when you get saved that all your battles are over. Uh, in many cases, they're just beginning. Uh, you find out you have an enemy, and uh, we'll talk about that enemy this evening and uh, how you can defeat that enemy. 6.30 tonight, a uh, very important service, and I'm going to talk tonight on an important subject. It's this. If Christ has given me the victory, why do I still struggle with sin? There's many Christians who are, uh, they know Christ is their Savior. They'll point to a time and they ask them, who are you trusting in to take you to heaven? They'll say, I'm trusting Jesus Christ. The Bible says we have victory, but we struggle. And we, in some cases, succumb to sin. Why is that? And how can we prevent that from happening? I think it'll be a great, great truth for you this evening. And I hope you'll be back to, to be in the evening service tonight uh, at 630. Okay. And uh, then, ladies, your night out is tomorrow night, <clears throat> 630 to 830 uh, in the Fellowship Hall. Just $3 a person. You're going to have some pizza and some salad and some fruit. And you are also uh, going to be addressing some missionary postcards for our missionaries. And you are going to be on The Price is Right. Okay, so uh, don't miss that. You may, you may be the next contestant on The Price is Right, all right? So uh, make sure you're there tomorrow evening. You'll have a great time together, and uh, you look forward to that. Then don't forget, those of you in Grove City School of the Bible, that begins Tuesday evening, and that'll be in the Fellowship Hall as well. Uh, so be, there, be there early. You start right at 7. Is that right, Brother Yoda? Right at 7 o'clock. So be there early so you can stay on time and stay on schedule. And then, of course, back here for the Wednesday night service at 7 p.m. <clears throat> Next Saturday at 8.15 is our men's breakfast. And uh, we trust your fellows will sign up and be there for that. Always a great time of fellowship together and a challenge from God's Word at our men's breakfast on Saturday morning, January 23rd. Now, coming up in February, of course, will be I Love My Church Month. And we start that off with the first Sunday of February, which is I Love My Bible Sunday. And uh, it's also... Uh, National Bible Publishing Month. And um, what, what we have is we have some of these uh, folders. They're called coin folders where you can store quarters in them. Okay, they'll hold up a $5 or quarters. Um, some of you, uh, how many of you have a, a jar or something that you throw loose change in on a regular basis? Many of you do. <clears throat> Just take a few quarters out of there and 
put them in here. Let's see how many of these folders we can get and get them filled in, and we'll bring them in. And then on the first Sunday of February, we'll collect those, and then we'll send the offering down to BPS to print Bibles for missionaries. And uh, we want to be part of publishing the Word of God. Uh, we should not leave to unsaved secular publishing companies to publish God's Word. Uh, God's people ought to publish God's word. And there's a great press down at Milford, and uh, we want to keep that press running. And so we want to give these folks the word of God. Uh, the ushers have these back there, don't you guys? <clears throat> we want you to make sure that you, uh, how many of you want a, you, you want a coin folder? Grab them, fellas. Let's pass them out, all right? Let's just make sure everybody gets one. Even the kids can get one because they can fill it up, okay? And uh, if a couple other guys wanted to jump up, Brother Yoder, would you help? That way we can get one in each section. Somebody over here? Sergi, don't you jump up. You're a visitor. Good night. There you go. Brother Jarvis, would you help? Brother Paul Abel on that side. That way you can get that side. Sergi will help anywhere he wants to, anywhere he can. And then, Brother Yoder, if you, or whenever somebody's done, jump up and give the choir some, all right? Okay. When you fill one up, if you want another one, then you see one of the ushers, and they'll, they'll know where they are, and they'll be able to get you some. And uh, I'd love to just give a bunch of these and uh, collect as much as we can to get the Word of God published. I think it says, does it say on here, Bob? Yeah, every full coin folder will provide two whole Bibles or five New Testaments for a missionary somewhere in the world. So that's two Bibles you got right there or five New Testaments. And, uh, boy, that's a great thing great cause and so we'll do that we'll collect those now the first sunday of february uh february 7th that'll be i love my bible sunday and we'll we'll collect those for the publishing of bibles printing of bibles all right everybody got it okay let's take a moment now we'll welcome any guests we have with us in the service uh anybody visiting here this morning is your first time at bible baptist church and uh this is Sergi, why don't you introduce your family? I think you've been here before. Of course, he comes to our Friday night RU, and they were here New Year's Eve for our service on New Year's Eve. And uh, but I think some folks don't know who you are. I'm your family. Would you introduce your family to us, please? Okay. All right. All right, amen. Great, great planning, huh? Amen. That's congratulations. That's great. Good to have you this morning. Thank you so much. He is. Uh, these folks are from the Ukraine, and um, he is uh, can speak Russian in Ukraine. And uh, he's going to be. He's been talking with Brother Moreland and Brother Yoder, and uh, they're going to be helping them with some Russian and such. And so, uh, just uh, just a great blessing to have this family with us today. God bless you. Uh, take just a minute and fill the card out for us. That way we'll have a record of your visit with us this morning. In a little bit, when the offering comes by, just put the card in the plate. Keep the pen as our gift to you for coming today, all right? We're glad you're here. Let's give them a warm welcome, shall we? Thank you. 
287287. If you from sin are longing to be free, look to the Lamb of God. 287. We're going to sing the first and last together. <clears throat> On that first. If you from sin are longing to be free, look to the Lamb of God. He to redeem you died on Calvary. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. For He alone is able to save you. Look to the Lamb of God. Fear not when shadows on your pathway fall. singing this morning. Let's go over to 275, just a few pages back. 275, it is well. It is well with my soul. Let's all stand together as we sing. When peace like a river. On that first together. When peace like a river attended my way. When sorrows like sea And greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guest. We'll come back and sing the last stanzas together. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed us. 
assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed for my soul it is well with my soul it is sin oh the bliss of this glorious sight. let's sing that third together my sin oh the bliss yes God my sin not in part but the whole is You can be seated, I think. Man, oh man, that's good. I don't know how many times I've sung that song in 50 years of being saved, but I still get goosebumps when we sing that last stanza. Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back like a scroll. Boy, won't it be great to see that happen? Man, I want to go in the rapture, brother. I, I guarantee it. That would be great. And uh, great singing this morning. Good uh, Good to have you in. The kids are in with us today, the children, so they're going to stay for the preaching this morning. Uh, every now and then it's good for the kids to be in church, and uh, we're going to leave them in here so you uh, help them to uh, listen carefully and uh, to be quiet so we can uh, hear the Word of God today, okay? Let's pray, and we'll ask God's blessing on the offering this morning. Brother Wright, lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Father, it is well with our soul. It's okay with us if you come back today, Lord. We, we love you, Lord, and you are an amazing God. And we're grateful for all the things that you're doing in, through, and for our church. We thank you for each member that is here today, the people that you're bringing in to help us uh, teach the Bible and 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 uh, and and. And learn the Bible, and uh, Father, you're just amazing, and we love you. Um, we look forward to what you have for us today. Be with the pastor as he opens up the only book you've ever written and teaches us about our Savior. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for all that you do. We pray, Father, that you would help us get the right people in our lives and the wrong people out. Amen. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen.
Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please. The book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, please, for our scripture reading today, Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> we are going to read verses 1 through 11, Colossians chapter 3 and verses 1 through 11. We'll read the verses responsively. We'll begin together on one, and then I'll read two, and together on three. And we'll alternate reading the verses like that until we end together on verse 11 of Colossians chapter 3. As our custom is, let's stand together, please, and we'll read God's Word, all of us standing to read the Scripture. And let's begin together on verse 1 of Colossians chapter 3. Ready? If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walk some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. And let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. And Lord, we pray that our hearts will be ready and receptive to what you have for us today. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful singing this morning. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord. It's a good spirit in this place today. We know that it's the spirit of the Lord. So, Lord, bless the special. Use it to speak to our hearts. And then, Lord, may the spirit of God. May each of us have ears to hear what he would say to his church this morning. It's in Christ's name I ask it. Amen.
heart would break there's a purpose in every change he makes that others would see my life and know that God makes no mistakes that others would see my life and know Now, Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word. I want to thank you this morning, Lord, for the Bible. I want to thank you, Father, for giving us your words and preserving them for us, that we have them in our hands today. We do not believe that the book we hold are just the words of men or the words of a man. We do believe it in truth to be the words of God. Lord, we believe that they're quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And they will pierce even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit of the joints and the morrow. And that they are a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. Lord, I pray for your help today as I bring this truth from Colossians chapter 3. And I do pray you'll help the folks as they listen this morning. I desire, Lord, that we would grasp a hold of what it means when Paul wrote that Christ is all. And Christ is our life. May we understand that. May we grasp it today. And may we live it out in our lives. It's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Colossians chapter 3. If you have your Bible open to that passage again. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. What is Jesus Christ to you? You don't have to answer that out loud. Just to yourself. Well... Some people would say Jesus Christ has a place in my life, a very important place in my life. But Jesus Christ doesn't just want a place in your life. That's never what He asks for in the Bible. Jesus Christ doesn't just even want a big place in your life, a large place or an important place in your life. He deserves and He desires and He demands preeminence in your life that He would be the preeminent one. Now, ask yourself this question. Does Jesus Christ have preeminence in my life? Does Jesus Christ have preeminence in my life? Look at the Scripture here in Colossians chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. And then look down verse 11, where there's either Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So I want to talk to you this morning about that little phrase right there, Christ is all. All. A-L-L. You know, you've heard me say before, all, all means all, and that's all all means. But when it says Christ is all, that means He's everything. When Christ is all, that means there's nothing outside of Him. He is all. Paul put it another way up in verse 4. He said, Christ, who is our life? In the book of Philippians, he put it this way, for me to live is Christ. So he's continually telling us he's not just giving us life. He's not just pointing us to life. He is life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said, John 14 and verse number 6. Now you understand, the Bible says over in John 17, Jesus in His prayer, I think the the true Lord's prayer in the garden, Jesus prayed, and this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. He said, this is eternal life, that they know You, and the only way they're going to know You is through Me. And that's eternal life, is when you know God through Jesus Christ. Now listen, 
Eternal life is not knowing about God. Eternal life is not knowing about Christ. Do you understand this morning that knowing about somebody and knowing somebody are two different things? There are people in this room today, I would mention a name and you would, I'd say, do you know so-and-so? And you may say, yeah, I know them. And what you really mean is, I know about them. I've read about them, I've heard about them, other people have talked about them. And you may feel like you know them, but you really don't know them. If you came to meet them face to face and you said, uh, hey, how you doing? They would look at you and say, who are you? They don't know you. And there's a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing all about the Savior and knowing the Savior. I'm afraid there's a lot of people, I think that's, I think that's really the great dividing line that, that, that what, where the Bible differentiates between the broad way that leads to destruction and the narrow way that leads to life. God says there's a broad road that leads to destruction. There's a wide gate. And, and you know what? He says many are going on that road. And you've got to believe that the many that are on that road, not that, listen, they don't believe they're wrong. And if you ask them, do you, know, do you know Jesus? Many of them would say, yeah, I know Jesus. And what they mean is, I know about Him. I've been in church. I've gone to church all my life. And, and I've heard about Jesus. But the ones who are on the narrow way, and the few there be there find it, are the ones who know Him. And know Him personally. There's not Jesus plus anything. It's not some, there's not anything after Jesus. Once you know Him... <clears throat> you have eternal life. Someone said you can go deeper into Jesus, but you can never go beyond Jesus. Christ is all and in all. Now, there's a couple of things I want you to notice, and then we'll get into the message this morning. I want you to notice in the first few verses here of Colossians 3, I want you to notice that we've been crucified with Christ. Did you notice that? The Bible says in verse number 3, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Did you know you're looking at a dead man? I hope I'm looking at some dead people. Been cru- the Bible, that's why Paul said in the book of Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He said, but I was crucified with Christ. That old man, that old nature, that old sinful flesh, that died when Christ died. The old nature was buried when Christ was buried. And, and, and when he was raised from the dead, the new man was raised from the dead. Not the old man. We've been crucified with Christ. That's a, that's a great truth of living a crucified life. A dead man is dead to any temptation and any uh, form of, of outside pressure or persuasion you'd want to put on him. He's absolutely immune to it. But the Bible says we're not just dead with Christ, we've been raised with Christ. Verse 1, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. So now I've been risen with Christ. Risen with Him. What happened when, when I was, listen, before salvation, I was only a body and a soul. My spirit was dead and so was yours. What came alive when the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. What was dead was our spirit. That's what died when Adam sinned in the garden. His spirit died. God said, the day you eat of the tree, you will surely die. Well, they didn't drop dead physically. They were still there. So it wasn't physical death. Their body and soul were still there, but their spirit died. And that ability they had to communicate with God is no longer there. And that's why the Bible says the natural man doesn't understand the things of the Spirit of God. Because He's just body and soul. And it's the Spirit that bears witness with God's Spirit. So when God quickens us, when He saves you, your Spirit comes alive. And we're, we're made alive. We're, we, we, be, we become alive in Jesus Christ. We said in Sunday school today, that's the operation of the Holy Spirit. He does that. So I know that I'm dead with Christ and I'm risen with Christ. And yet, the Bible says, I'm to live in Christ. Christ who is our life. We have the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. Paul went on to say in Galatians when he said that I'm crucified with Christ and unless I live, he said, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So now that he said, I'm not just living, Christ is living through me. He's living in me and through me. 
That's the whole, that's the whole idea of the Christian life. It's not me doing the work. It's Christ doing it through me. I just have to get out of the way and allow Him to live. Now, that's, that, I can't do that. I have to have the help of the Holy Spirit to do that. But every one of us are designed to live that way. But then it says something very important here. Verse number 3 again. Notice what it says. You're dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Did you get that? Your life is hid with Christ in God. So if the devil wants to get to you, I'm in Christ and Christ is in God. He's got to get through God and he's got to get through Christ before he can ever get to me. Because my life is hid with Christ in God. That's a pretty safe place to be. And, and that's the hidden life that we're all supposed to have. I died with Him. I was raised with Him. I live with Him. And I'm hidden with Him. Notice back in chapter 2 of Colossians. Would you look there please? Notice verse number 3. It says, In whom, and that's Jesus Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Talking about Jesus. And that's hidden in Jesus. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But wait a minute. They're hidden in Jesus, but so am I. I'm hidden in Jesus too. And so I can, I can, I can know that all the things, that's why I say, all the things I need to know are in Christ. Because in Him are all the things of wisdom and knowledge. And so anything I need, I'll find in Him. We get the idea that, yeah, you know, Christ and this, this Christianity, that's kind of what I do on Sunday, but you know, my life is mine the rest of the week. You got it all wrong. You, you got it mixed up. Christ is our life. Christ isn't what you do on Sunday. Christ is, is how we live every day of the week. In Him we live and move and have our being. Christ is all. Christ is all. Now I want you to, I'm going to give you three simple things this morning about how you can know whether Christ is all in your life. Christ is all and in all is what the Scripture says in verse 11. And I want you to look at three verbs in some verses here that will center around the three things that will happen when Christ is all in all to you. In the first verse, the Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek. Put a circle around that word seek. That's the first verb. In verse 2, it says, Set your affection on things above. Put a circle around that little word set. Set your affection. And then down to verse number 5, where it says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Uh, go ahead and circle or put underline around that word mortify. Mortify means put to death. Put to death. Mortify. Three verbs. Seek, set, and mortify. If you want them all to begin with an S, you can put slay instead of mortify. But, but make sure that those are the three verbs we're going to look at. And if you ask, what happens in my life when I will be able to say Christ is all? What will that look like? I think we'll see it if we look at those three verbs. Number one, the word or the verb seek. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Number one, what will it look like? Jesus will capture your attention. Jesus will capture your, I'm sorry, your capture your ambitions. Your ambitions. Seek those things which are above. You know what you seek after? You seek after your ambitions. You seek after your goals. You seek after the things you want to accomplish and the things you care about. And here, the Bible says our ambition ought to be to seek the things that are above. In Matthew, Jesus said our ambition ought to be to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That ought to be our ambition. Now I want you to go back to chapter 2. And I want you to look at some things in chapter 2 because that, that always helps us understand the chapter 3. 
Because he said, if ye then be risen with Christ, then seek those things that are above. Because chapter 2, he spends talking about things that are below. Things that are beneath. Now he's saying, but since you're risen with Christ, you seek things that are above. But some things in chapter 2 are things that are below. Let's look at some of those things. Look at verse 8 of chapter 2. Paul writes, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So here we see the, the first thing that some of the things that we seek that are below, the first thing I see is the reasoning of the world. The reasoning of the world. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. He said, after tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. The rudiment there is the basic elements of the world. And he talks about being spoiled by them. When you spoiled somebody, you, you, you in, when they, in battles they would defeat a country. And when they won the victory, they did carry away the spoils. The winner got all, okay? And so they carried them away. They spoiled them. And that's what he's talking about here in that word about being spoiled. They carry away the goods. And he's saying, listen, don't let the world carry you away captive. Don't let the world carry you captive to their way of reasoning. The problem, and I think one of the, one of the problems in our country is we have allowed the pulpits of our churches to get carried away with the reasoning of the world. We've let the pulpits of our churches get carried away with political correctness instead of being true to the Word of God and true to the Bible. Don't get carried away like that. Don't let the world spoil you. Then he says, there's something else here, the rituals of the world. The rituals of the world. In verses 13 through 17 of chapter 2, he talks about you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now he's dealing with people who've been steeped in the Jewish religion. A lot of ceremony, a lot of rituals and drink offerings and meal offerings and such. And, and he's talking about their, their diets and their special days. And some people were saying, well now that you're saved, you still have to do all those things. You can't give all those special days up. You can't give up those feasts. And you can't give up keeping all those holy days. And Paul is saying, don't you let anybody judge you about those days anymore. No longer is it necessary for you to observe the Sabbath day. Okay. By the way, Sunday, today is not the Sabbath. Today is Sunday. Today is the Lord's day. It's the first day of the week, not the seventh day of the week. And so, it's not, the, it's not the Sabbath, it is the Lord's Day, a different kind of day. And if you think, oh, I think we ought to keep the Sabbath, well, you better be careful. Because you weren't allowed to kindle a fire on the Sabbath. And let me, let me give you a reminder. Brother Yoder, you're a mechanic, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when you start the car, you ignite a fire somewhere, don't you? Hmm? Uh, that means you better not drive your car if you observe the Sabbath. Uh-oh. You're in trouble. In fact, if that happened, you'd be stoned. So I would tell you, we probably don't keep the Sabbath in that sense, even those who think they should. But you see, he says, those things were all taken out of the way. Those things were nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. And he took care of those when he died on the cross. And then he says at the end, it's interesting, he says those things were just a shadow of things to come. They're just shadows. They're not substance. They were shadows of the real thing. And so you, you, when you try to keep those rituals, you're chasing the shadow and you're missing the real thing. You're missing Christ. A dog may chase a shadow of a bird on the ground. But it's kind of silly because the bird's in the sky. People do that when they substitute rituals for reality. We're seeking things that are above. And that's the reality. The things here are just shadows of the reality. 
Then he says, let's be careful that you don't go after the religions of the world. Notice what he said in verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility, in worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, not holding the head. Who's the head? It's Christ. It's a capital H. From which all the body by joints and bands have nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increased of God. Paul's saying, be careful of the reasons of the world and the rituals of the world, but be careful of the religions of the world. Don't, don't let no man beguile you. Here in Colossae, they had Gnosticism, which was worshiping of angels. And so he has to deal with that uh, with the church here. He talks about how they get puffed up in their mind. They get proud. Don't, don't follow after some religious philosophy or some, some religion that wants to talk about angels and worshiping other heavenly beings other than Jesus. Why? He's saying you look to the head. You hold on to the head. That's Jesus Christ. Because He's going to get to it in, in chapter 3. Christ is all. And He is in all. Christ is our life, not angels, Christ. The focus is not an angel on my window. The focus is Christ in my life. That's what counts. One preacher said he'd been preaching long enough that he's always amazed at two things. Number one, that men and women will not believe the truth. It always amazes you when you give the truth to someone and they won't believe it. But the other thing he said that amazed me is what men and women will believe as the truth. <laughs> and that's true. Satan is not against religion as long as it's one of the religions of the world. You can seek the reasonings of the world. You can seek vain philosophy. You can seek the rituals of the world, special days or special diets or some kind of ceremonies. You can seek the religions of the world and worship anything except God. Or you can get caught up in the regulations of the world. Notice verse 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and well worship, in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body and not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. He's saying when you, he's saying when he talks about taking taking part of things here that God says are forbidden. This language is a little difficult sometimes, but uh, listen, he's he's talking about. You're not going to be any more like Christ by what you don't do or what you do do. Listen carefully now. Don't want you to, don't want you to miss this. When you get a list of what you think you can do that will make you a good Christian, then you live your life by your list. You know what you do when you complete your list? You look at your list and say, what a good boy am I. And guess what? You don't keep my list, so you're not a very good Christian. The problem is, I hope you don't have a list. Because you'll keep your list, and I won't be on your list. And everybody gets a different list. Years ago, our kids, our teenagers, I, I, was, I was probably, let me think here. Bear with me, it's not easy. Um, I think it was around 1986, so... I was uh, just a young pastor, um, and um, uh, kids went off to camp. I forget how many teenagers we sent to camp, uh, maybe 12 or 13 teenage, teenagers went to camp, and, and I think they came back, Brother Wallace, and I think like nine of them said they got saved. As far as I knew, they all went to camp saved. And so I started asking, well, what, tell me what's going on. Well, if they had a preacher there that week. And what he did, Brother Yoder, was he was, if you don't read your Bible this much every day, if you're not praying this much every day, if you're not doing this every day, then you're not saved. So the kids came forward and got saved. 
And everybody thinks, oh, that's wonderful. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What happens when they go back to camp next year and the new guy has a new set of lists that they're not doing? Then they've got to come and get saved all over again. No, it's not, it's not by regulation. It's not a list of things you do. Most of us would like it if, if I could be spiritual and I could really have a close walk with God. Just give me a list and, and tell me what I need to do and I'll do, 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 do. Good, I got it. That's not what spirituality is. You're no, no one's spiritual by what you don't do. He's saying there's a will worship here. Hey, listen, discipline's important. But discipline doesn't mean you're spiritual. There are some tremendous military men that are incredibly disciplined. But they're not spiritual. But what discipline will do, it will make spirituality available to you. You know what it took to get up this morning and, and, and assess the damages in the mirror? and decide what needed to be done before you could make a public appearance, and then you set out to work on that? A shower, a, a shave, a comb, a, some clothes, and get yourself ready. You know what You know what it took to get here this morning? It took some discipline. If you're honest, some of you had the thought, it's cold, it's winter, people are sick, I think I'll roll over. But discipline said it's Sunday and you've got to go to church. Now you're here hearing a message about how Christ is all, but you're avail that's available to you because you were disciplined enough to be here. You know what it takes to read your Bible and let God speak to you every day? It takes discipline to get up and open your Bible. If you don't ever do that, God's never going to be able to, open, to speak to you the truths of His Word. It takes discipline to pray. And to take time to talk to God. So nothing wrong with the discipline, but the discipline is a means to an end. It's not the end. And you don't, you don't do not do certain things just to be spiritual. Well, don't lie, don't tell dirty jokes, don't cheat anybody, don't steal anything. You do that for a couple of weeks, you think, boy, I'm pretty spiritual. You know, the Bible talks about several things when it likens the Christian life to something. And one of the things it likens to is a building. That's why the Bible says when we get together, we ought to edify each other. Edifice. It's a building. So we're here to build one another up in the faith. We're to speak the things that edify each other, that build somebody else up. And so it's a, it's a building process. Another place he talks about it's a growing process. Wednesday night we're talking about adding to our faith. Growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're growing. So it's a process that takes place in our Christian life. And so that's, and that, by the way, that's how you advance spiritually. You grow. Suppose, all right, who has a, who has a new baby? Alana is three months old. Okay? Now, Nikki, I'll give you, I'm going to give you some parenting advice on how to rear your daughter. Don't, don't feed her arsenic, okay? All right. Great advice, isn't it? It's going to help her rear a child, isn't it? Did she, got, she get, did she get real good instruction there about what not to do? Is that going to make her a good parent? No, it isn't. That, and, and we think we can tell somebody what not to do, and that's going to make them a good Christian. It's not what not to do. It's what you ought to do. Now, there are some things you will do and there are some things you won't do. But it won't, because, it won't be because it's an act of keeping a list. It's because you love somebody. You see, when you enter into a contract, when you enter into your, and, and you do, we call it a marriage contract. But when you said your vows to your husband and your wife, listen, you, didn't, you, didn't, you, you said I do and you, she said I do and you were married. Listen, your husband didn't pull out a list and say, okay, now here's the things you can't do now that you're married to me. No, he didn't. He figured, you know what? All I'm asking you to do is love me for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Why is it when we come to our relationship with God, we say, God, give me a list. God said the first, here's your list. 
Number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength. Amen. Here's the second on the list. Love your neighbor as yourself. When Peter, when Peter denied him and, and denied and cursed and swore and he went back to fishing and Jesus came to the shore, did Jesus ring him out and say, Peter, what were you doing? Peter, you didn't look at the list. You weren't supposed to hang around those people. He didn't say that. You know, what did he ask Peter? Lovest thou me? You know what he knew? It was a love problem. It's a love problem. There are things I will not do. There are things I, I desire to do. But I want to do them because I love Jesus Christ. Because I love the Lord. And I want to do it because I love Him. That's the growth that you're looking for. A thousand don'ts won't make you more like Christ. You see, Christianity is not a legal relationship. It's a love relationship. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart. You can read your Bible out of will worship or you think you've got to read so many chapters a day or else you're not a good Christian. And by the way, I, I, don't, by the, I will say this, I don't believe a chapter a day keeps the devil away. Okay? Just for the record. All right? I don't know who came up with that. but Can you read your Bible and not love God? Yes. But you won't love God and not read your Bible. Can you tithe of your income and not love God? Yeah. But you won't love God and not tithe your income. And not be faithful in stewardship. Do you understand? I like that bumper sticker that says, tithe if you love Jesus. Anybody can honk. <laughs> I like that one. None of, none of the reasonings of the world, the rituals of the world, the religions of the world, none of those things are going to make you like Christ. It won't happen. Christ is all in all. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above. Seek Him. Jesus has to capture our ambitions. Let's go to the second, second verb. The second verb is is the word set. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Set your affection. Jesus not only will capture my ambition, but He dominates my attention. He'll dominate my attention. He, I set my affection on things above. It means it's what I pay attention to. It's what I... It, it, I think we said in Sunday school, it's what we set your mind upon. That's your attention. You set your mind upon it. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You ever heard somebody say, oh, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Ever heard that expression? Yeah. I rarely have found that individual. I found quite a few the other way. That they were so earthly minded, they weren't any heavenly good. The truth is, the verse is telling us that Jesus is to dominate our attention. I'm to meditate upon Him. I'm to fix my attention upon Him. There are many things that, that pull at our mind. There's many things that want our attention. You know what I found out through the years? The things that cry out loudest for your attention are not the important things. They're things that don't really matter. But they're the ones that want our attention. The important things we have to give our attention to. You're going to have to, if you're going to give, hey, and in this day and age, more than ever before. I know, when all the gadgets come out, whether it's all going back to the microwave oven, to anything since then, it's all about how it's going to give you more time. How's that working for us? Doesn't give us more time, does it? So he talks about setting our mind or setting our affection, our attention on Jesus Christ. The Bible says much about meditation. I'm not talking about Eastern Oriental meditation where you hum, you hum, and you hold your fingers or something like that or get in some awkward position. I'm not talking about that. And by the way, a Christian doesn't need to be doing that either. 
Christian doesn't have anything to do with yoga or anything like that. You're opening yourself up to things that you don't want to be opened up to. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Guard your heart. Set your mind. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed, it's set, it's fixed on thee, for he trusteth in thee. Looking for that peace in your heart? Looking for that calmness of spirit? You've got to set your attention on Jesus Christ. He's the Prince of Peace. You have trouble going to sleep at night? Quit counting sheep. Talk to the shepherd. He's the Prince of Peace. He'll calm your spirit. When you can't sleep at night, you say, oh, my mind is just racing all these places. That's what you set your affection on. That's what you set your attention on. Get your mind focused on Christ. Set your affection on things above. Christ has, when, when Christ is all, He'll capture your ambition. He will dominate your attention. And then number three, He'll regulate your actions. He'll regulate your actions. First verb was seek. The second verb was set. The third one is mortify. Or we said the other S we could use was slay. If Christ is my life, then I am to live like Christ and He's to live through me. The verb mortify means to put to death forcibly and immediately. Put to death forcibly and immediately. Why would you kill something? Why would you kill anything? How many of you ever killed something in your life? Huh? Okay. Why? Okay. Killed it to eat it. Okay. You get home today and you walk in and in the corner of your kitchen there's a, there's a spider about this big and he's black and he's good. What are you going to do? Yeah, you're going to kill him. You don't want to share your house with him. Okay, And you're not going to eat him. I hope not. Maybe if you covered him with chocolate. But, you know. We were not married very long. We lived in, we were still in college. I did paper routes through college. I would have to be at the place to get the papers at 2 a.m. Did the Chicago Sun-Times and the Chicago Tribune. Had about 350 papers I deliver every morning. And I um, had to be there 2 o'clock and then I'd get home usually 5.30 to 6 o'clock and get cleaned up and left for school at 7. Went to Bible college. Got home one night and I got home one morning about 6 a.m. And, and we had one of those, uh, it was, a, it was a, a couch, you know. You sat like this and then you, you would push the back and then it would lay down flat, okay. And we, that's what, that was our first bed. We slept there. And I come home, my wife was standing up on that with all the covers pulled up to her like this. I said, what is going on? For those of you who don't know that era, we didn't have cell phones, okay. So I said, she goes, not long after you left, I heard a mouse. And there was a mouse in there. And she didn't want that mouse grabbing onto the covers, crawling up on the bed. And, and she stood up there for almost four hours. <laughs> Frozen. So we turned the light on and I get the broom and I'm looking for a mouse. Ended up, it, it, long story, but we ended up getting him in the corner and I, I got him with the broom and killed him. Okay? And then we said, now we can go back to bed. No, I didn't. I'm not going to leave a dead mouse laying there. What do I do with something that's dead? I'm going to get rid of him. I don't like that guy. I don't want him living in my house. You, you kill things that you don't like. You kill things that you hate. Now notice what he says in verse 5. You mortify your members which are on the earth fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. Those things that are upon the earth, those things that are in our flesh, we put to death. There, those are things that a Christian ought to hate. 
Don't get so convoluted in our thinking and say, oh, I don't want to be guilty of a hate crime. No, it's right to hate things. The Bible said in the Old Testament, there's six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to Him. There's absolutely proper. Listen, Billy Sunday used to say, if you love flowers, you must hate weeds because they're going to kill your flowers. And if you love things that are right and you love God, you must hate evil. If you love righteousness, you must hate unrighteousness. And so God says here, put it to death, kill it immediately. If you want to know God's hate list, it's in Proverbs 6, by the way, verses 16 through 19. David said this in Psalm 119, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. I hate every false way. So I don't put my arm around every religion in the world and say, well, your religion's as good as mine. No, I can't do that. If I, if I know the right way, and Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is no other way but Jesus Christ. And I love that way. And if I love that way, I hate every other false way. The psalmist said, I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. The reason that so many Christians still keep narcotics and liquor and, 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 and atheism or pornography or really any sin in our life is we haven't come to love God enough that we'll hate the evil. Hate it enough that you'll kill it and get it out of your life. Christ is all. Not a part, not a big part, not an important part. He's all. No room for anything else. Nothing else beyond Him. What's the Christian life? It's Jesus Christ. Christian life isn't Bible Baptist Church. Christian life is not prayer. It's not the Bible. It's not doing good. It's Jesus Christ. Christ who is our life. He is all. And in all. We started with a question. Who is Jesus Christ to you? Does He have the preeminence in your life? Is He all? Or is He just a part? Higher ground is where Christ is all. Make Him your all this morning. Heavenly Father, I bow before You now. Thank You, Lord, for the wonderful words in Colossians, the Scripture here we've looked at this morning. Father, thank You for the Apostle Paul and the words You gave him to pen, that Christ is all and in all. And Lord, I know that those in this room who've received Christ as their Savior, he, he lives in our heart by faith. But many in the room and in and, and, and this room would probably honestly have to admit He's not all. He's only a part of their life. Oh, that we'd move to higher ground this morning. And we'd have folks bow the knee and say, Christ is all. I will seek those things that are above, not the things that are below. I'll set my affection, set my attention, put my heart and my mind on Christ. And I will put to death the things that are against Christ. I will not allow it to be in my life at all. I will mortify it. I will put it to death. Immediately, and forcibly that Christ may be all and in all. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. Right now, just between you and God, I wonder how many folks here this morning would say, Pastor, there's a time in my life when I knew that I was a sinner and I needed to, a Savior. And that Jesus was a Savior I needed. I knew that He's the way, the truth, and the life. 
And I called on Jesus and I asked Him to be my Savior. Pastor, I know I'm saved. I know I have eternal life. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. I wonder who's here this morning would say, Pastor, I, I can't say that for sure. I don't have the assurance in my heart that if I got a sharp pain through my chest and I would slumped over, that my next breath would be in heaven. I don't know that. But Pastor, I appreciate you praying for me. Would you let me pray for you? I'll not embarrass you. We'll not call you out, but I'll pray for you. Would you slip your hand up now? You couldn't raise it the first time, but you'll raise it this time. Would you do it? God bless you. Thank you. Appreciate your honesty. Is there others this morning will join these? Say, Pastor, pray for me today. The message was to believers. Christ is all. Only you know whether Christ is all in your life or not. But I wonder how many folks here this morning would say, Preacher, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart today. And I want Christ to be all. I really do. And I'm going to use those verbs, seek, set, and mortify. And I'm going to ask Christ to be my all. Pastor, pray for me this morning. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have your invitation. If you're here today and you're not certain of your salvation, then I want you to come. We have people who have been trained. They'll take a Bible and they'll show you how you can know for sure you're on your way to heaven. You have eternal life. Christian, you just want to bow the knee to Christ today and say, I want to set my affection on things above. I want to seek those things that are above. Lord, I want you to capture my ambitions. I want you to dominate my attention and I want you to regulate my actions. I want Christ to be all in my life. Then you respond to Him and obey what He's telling you to do this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts today. I pray your will be done now in these next few moments. May each individual do exactly what you're speaking to their heart about right now. May no one resist. And may holy decisions be made for you this morning that will make a difference in time and also in eternity. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist plays. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart this morning. Respond to Him. Oh, to Jesus That's right. I surrender. All oh, to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him. He Christ is, is all. Christ is all. Live. I surrender That's all. Right. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender humbly at His feet. I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Oh, oh, to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that Thou art mine. I surrender. Surrender all. Oh, to Jesus.
Jesus, I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fulfill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Look this way for a minute, will you? That's the need of our country. It's, it's for God's people to be God's people. Surrender. To, to say, Christ is my life. I read just this week, and somebody who I, re I respect highly, he said, that, he said that going to church is, and I understand probably the context of what you meant it, but he said it's like going to the gym. It's not... It's not your life, it's so you can have a better life. And I understand that a little bit, but wait a minute. Christ isn't that way. We get the idea, I think, in America anymore, let's just come to Christ because He'll give you a better life. And He, do, he does give you a better life, but the truth is, He is our life. Don't, don't just, I think a lot of times we, we got folks who are just with Christ because of what He'll do for them. And he's going to do this, and he's going to do this, and he's going to give me this. And, and, and we got that, uh, we, 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 we're not understanding what that's all about. Oh, the need of the hour that we just live. Let Christ live through us. That's so important. Christ is our life. For me to live is Christ. Is that what we really can say? The attack in Burkina Faso, West Africa or Africa, have you heard about it? Motel, hotel over there got attacked, 28 people were killed. One of those that were killed was an American missionary, Mike Rittering and his wife. Were his, Mike Rittering was there with another pastor. They went different directions when the attack began. The pastor made it safely, but the missionary did not. And leaves behind a wife and four children. They were ministering to orphans and widows in that African village. And uh, just, uh, I, I, I wish I had the testimony that that wife gave when she got the news from somebody she sent out to search three different places and they found his body at one of the morgues. The, the testimony that she put was just amazing. 43 years of age. And he's now with the Lord. Don't think, don't think, oh, I got a long time to live. You don't know that. We better make every day count. We better, what we're going to do for Christ, what we're going to, have you ever thought I need to have, Christ needs to be all, just, I'm just not ready for that yet. I mean, I'm only 21, I'm only 20, I'm only 18, I'm only a teenager, I'm only 30. I mean, what, wait a minute, you don't know. You could go in the presence of the Lord today. Christ is our life. <clears throat> I hope that's the case. Amen. Appreciate you being here. Kids, you did a great job. Wonderful job paying attention. You did great. Thank you for doing that this morning. Let's pray together and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for a wonderful day today. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for Jesus. <coughs> I pray, God, that he'll We'll keep our eyes fixed on Him. We run the race. We'll be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We'll rely upon the Holy Spirit of God who indwells us to help us and empower us and to teach us and to guide us. Lord, I pray that we've all have grown to be a little bit more like Christ because we were in Sunday school and church this morning. Dismiss us now with your care. Give us safety as we go our separate ways. Lord, I do pray for Mrs. Rittering and her children as they say goodbye to their husband, their co-laborer, their leader. Lord, we know our ways are not your ways. 
Our thoughts are not your thoughts, but we just pray your grace would be abundant on this family. And through the testimony of this man and his family, may many others come to know Christ as their Savior. Lord, bring us back now this evening for evening service, and we'll thank you for it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.